Chrissy said that when she was picking, or when they were thinking about who to pick, she really prized unpredictability, and I hope that I will satisfy that as a speaker, because I'm, I took my mandate to talk about central bank design and interpret it quite differently from the other three presenters, which I think is good in that unpredictable mandate. So whereas we spent quite a bit of time so far talking about the history of the Fed and how we got to how the Fed works things and what were the constraints and what were the events in case, for instance, of Julio's paper that led us to some of the operational choices that the Fed makes, I decided to instead think about central bank design as if one had a blank page and were to write what would be the optimal design to support monetary policy in, in the United States, unencumbered by history, uh, although certainly guided by the empirical evidence as well as the theory. And in particular, whereas Andrew Metric came armed with quotations, given that that was the style of paper that they were writing, I, came, uh, I come and said armed with references, and so I think I had more than 200, and now there's less in the sense of a literature review, in that I will instead inform myself by what do I think my reading of the literature says on how would one go about designing a central bank. This is not such an esoteric question, I would like, to, by the way, to add, because if you look at either countries that went through civil wars or secessions, or countries transitioning from communism, or even countries that decide to get together and create a currency union, and there's some pretty big ones that did so recently, they did have to sit down with somewhat like a blank sheet of paper and figure out what is at least the optimal design or some desirable design that we would like to have, and then had to adjust that to the circumstances. My approach is going to be to try to couch this in the language of mechanism design, in the sense of there is society that would like, us, would, like to, would like to achieve a certain set of goals, and would, for that, what needs to delegate this action to an agent, the central bank, how best to approach it then, or how to write down that problem in that sheet of paper? Well, as in a mechanism design problem, one needs to write first the objective function of the agent, the central bank. What objectives should we give the central bank? And what objectives does it have? Does it come into the problem with? Second, what resources does it have to get to these objectives? That is, how do we want to constrain its actions in terms of the resources it has access to? And third, and this being about macro policy, what is the equilibrium or implementability constraints in the case of Ramsey policymaking, or, but at least the equilibrium constraints, that is, to what extent is it that we will have, that society will respond to the way in which the central bank acts and moves, and therefore the way in which it moves in itself leads to a change in the structure of this. And so, given those three topics that needed to be covered to write this problem in that one piece of paper, that led me then to 12 questions or 12 topics for having to do with how to set up the objective function, four on what should be in the resource constraint or not, and four in terms of what should be the equilibrium constraints. And I'll try to cover at least eight or nine of them. With my emphasis being, and I'll refer to you to the paper for the others, um, with my emphasis being that I'm gonna to try to emphasize for the sake of the presentation, but not in the paper, some in which Perhaps the literature suggests things that are somewhat different from what is the current practice, even though in the paper it's much, it's, um, it's their novelty is as emphasized as what exists already. And so let me start with the first one, the objective function. And the first question is how strict should it be? That is, how well specified should it be? And there's a general democratic principle that certainly if society is going to give a lot of power to the central bank, it should very clearly say what that power should be used for. And yet if we look at current practice, certainly the mandate of the Fed is quite vague. There's, most central bank, most Fed governors end up writing at some point during their matter a speech where they say what is their interpretation of what the Federal Reserve Act is and of what their mandate is. Just the fact that they have to say what their interpretation is is already pretty decisive proof that indeed they have quite a bit of discretion in setting up their own mandate. Is that some of that suggested by the literature? Well, in some ways it is. While on the one hand, there is quite a bit of support for having, for instance, numerical inflation targets that indeed make it more specific what should be the mandate that the central bank pursues and that does have many benefits in terms of anchoring expectations and others. It is also the case, as Alberto Alizin and Guido Tabellini and others have argued, that in some decisions, I flagged here what's the optimal inflation rate, should we have inflation or price level targets, how much to adjust instruments in policy, where because both redistribution is not a big issue and two, knowledge is evolving quite quickly so that having a certain skill at absorbing that knowledge is more important than the constraint brought by a mandate, it is indeed optimal for the bureaucrat to be left with discretion in order to make that decision. And one can indeed formalize that trade-off. Turn to the second point, what should be the variable in this objective function, even if it's not a strict, strictly defined one and one that has some vagueness? Well, the th three observations. One, if inflation, in the long, if inflation is costly in welfare, and there's many reasons why it is, 
Two, if the central bank has pretty good control over short-term interest rates and the amount of reserves. And three, if there's a very strong correlation to low frequency between these things the central bank controls and inflation, which is costed society, it therefore follows that the central bank should be in charge of establishing a stable nominal anchor. And this does not seem, and this is certainly mostly consensual, I think. More interesting is exactly how to state the stable nominal anchor. There's been a lot of work, and I will not repeat that one, on why prices may be better than a monetary target. One that's more interesting is that even though inflation targeting is close to universal, there's actually quite a remarkable support in the theoretical literature for instead price level targets. And the Bank of Canada has done quite a bit of work summarizing that. But what I, the reason why I say it's remarkable is that it comes from very, very different perspectives. Price level targets, that is to have higher than average inflation followed by lower than average inflation instead of reverting, it's good if you think that there are sticky prices in the world because it implies that forward looking price setters will not raise their prices as much right now. It's good if you have a view that inflation is dominated by time consistency issues because then the benefits of positive surprise inflation get offset by the negative inflation you're going to have to have later on. It's good if you have a sticky information view of the world in that in, because a price level is going to give you the right uh, benchmark and the stability that agents need in order to make plans. It's good if you think that it's, there's a big danger in entering zero lower bound episodes because then the lower than average inflation is going to come with a commitment to higher than expected inflation. It's good from the perspective of financial markets because by definition of inflation, by imparting a unit root, is going to increase the variance of, of the price level looking forward and therefore it's going to lead to and inflation targeting is going to lead to higher risk premium and there are higher cost of capital. That is, I've just given you five, I think I have six in the paper, arguments for why price level targeting seem better than inflation targets. Third, implementing this requires choosing how to measure long run inflation. And here it's important that even though, and since we're talking about the long run, even though a, cost of, a measure of the cost of living may be the correct one in the sense of measuring welfare, it is important to note that in the year to year fluctuations of inflation, most of those, most of those most of the changes in the cost of living are due to changes in relative prices, some of which due to structural change in the economy that the central bank can do very little about. And so in a sense, when talking about a long-run inflation goal that can be monitored in a year-to-year, -year, one, one would like instead a measure of something like a pure inflation measure that filters out the relative prices. A fourth issue is should you also have a real long-run goal that has to do with whether you think the long-run Phillips curve is vertical or not. I won't add much beyond saying that there seems to be a very strong consensus that it is long run. I think my colleague Rick Mishkin stated that quite emphatically earlier today. Um, I would just like to note that the evidence for a vertical long run Phillips curve is somewhat not that strong. It's more of an, a case of not being able to reject null hypothesis than one of being able to accept them decisively. Third, if we then accept that the price level target is a long run goal for the central bank as measured by a pure inflation measure, what potential shoring goals should there be? And I would, I would claim or argue that a potential goal should pass three tests. First, can you define them in some measurable or somewhat at least concrete way? Two, can monetary policy actually have an effect on this goal? Why are we giving it to the central bank after all? And three, does it introduce a trade-off with the other goal? Let's say, for instance, price stability, because if by divine coincidence, pursuing price stability achieves the other goal, then there's no point in having to state it. When it comes to real activity, I think it passes all three tests. And therefore, having a dual mandate with something like what in modern terms we call flexible intuition targeting seems adequate. And why? Because we can define the goal, unemployment measures of the output gap with all of their imperfections still are, a, are ways to define it. Monetary policy, there's overwhelming evidence that monetary policy has an effect on real activity. And much more debated, I think there is, I think the bulk of the evidence, uh, although overwhelming is much too strong, more like the bulk of the evidence that there is a trade-off between stabilizing inflation, between economic stability and price level stability, as John Taylor has been putting forward for a long time. If I look instead at the old argument, another argument is should we then have a tripartite mandate and to include financial stability? The old arguments, I think, tended to fail all three of the tests, and they tended to include things like stabilizing asset price bubbles. And the reason is that these were never very well defined, and Marty Eichenbaum early said that Every time the house prices go up, half of the times you get a, half of the times you get a recession, half of the times you don't. Um, I, would, I would add to that that I think at every single month or quarter, you get somebody crying bubble at some market or another, and that tells me that there's something about this not being very well defined a measure. And certainly, monetary policy, as Alan Blinder has argued very often, has, 
very limited instruments to affect those. Having said that, in the last 10 years, there's been, I think, an extremely exciting research agenda showing that there is an argument for a tripartite mandate that has to do with, instead with using measures like leverage of financial institutions, the spread between borrowing and lending rates, or the way intermediaries fund themselves, all of which, indeed, can be defined in a somewhat measurable way. Monetary policy, I think there's been empirical evidence accumulating in the last few years that monetary policy can have an effect on these measures. And it can be shown that they do introduce somewhat of a trade-off. There, there are circumstances in which you may want to change policy to affect these, even if inflation and output seem in line. Fourth, a complementary way to pick the objective function is to pick the central banker. Um, now, the literature has argued strongly about the verges of committees, and I put some of the reasons there, and I won't even read them. I think a more, a more interesting question, a more open question, is then who should be represented in the committee? Um, I am skeptical that representing regional interests is important, because the evidence, at least for the United States, is that there's quite a significant amount of risk sharing across US states. If that's the case, even if I want to represent the interests of the citizens of Massachusetts, if they are already in markets diversifying away their idiosyncratic risks, then I should be focusing on aggregate risks only, and therefore there's no regional interests to be thinking about. Bringing new information is another argument often put forward, but again, the evidence is if that information was valuable, then the forecasts provided by, say, regional feds should be much better than the ones of the board, and the evidence doesn't seem to support that very much. Representing different age cohorts or sectors could be justified if we think there's clear redistribution, but I think we're still far from documenting very clear redistributive effects from monetary policy. Instead, having representation of different, say, potential, say, regional feds has to rely much more, and I think as a powerful argument, on there having to be different perspectives, there having to be original thinking for better ideas to arise, and that suggests a level of decentralization, or at least choice of central bankers, that's different from the other ones. Let's then turn to the resource constraint. There is a very strong central bank wisdom that says, thou shall not monetize the debt. Um, certainly at, at the other side of the Atlantic, it is repeated very often nowadays. There's a sense in which this is absolutely not correct. I mean, the central bank buys government debt by printing reserves. It monetizes the debt not just often, but every day as part of its action. So as stated like this, it's certainly not, not correct. Having said that, I think there's a better way to state this, which is that the central bank, working through the resource or or budget concern of the central bank, the central bank can only generate resources via seniorage, that is, by the printing of currency. And the only way to increase that, given that the central bank is committed to exchange on par currency for reserves, is to have higher inflation. Now, therefore, there is certainly a temptation for fiscal authorities to ask for more resources and that for those to come with higher inflation, therefore jeopardizing the long-run goal. A design principle is, therefore, that the, f that the central bank should not have to accommodate to that pressure. Note that this is very different from saying that a little bit of higher inflation may not help in the sense of devaluing nominal debt, or that some fiscal monetary coordination may not be important. Those are about unexpected inflation for the most part, if we think about either fiscal theory price level or, say, Sargent and Wallace arithmetics. Instead, this is saying that seniorage that is generated by expected persistent constant inflation should not be a, source, a regular source of revenue to the Treasury. Fiscal backing are very related. I'll do this one quite quickly, which is that when, in the old days, if you want a war, when the central bank is holding mostly short-run safe government bonds, backed by short-run safe reserves, for the most part, net income will always be positive. When the central banks, when instead the assets it holds have a risk and maturity mismatch with its liabilities, sometimes net income will be negative. It's important to emphasize that there's nothing absolutely wrong with net income being negative sometimes in the central bank, and I've tried to make that point in the paper with Rob Hall recently. There's absolutely nothing wrong, Unless, of course, when the central bank makes positive income, it has to remit it to the treasury, and then when it has negative net income, it does not get those back. That is, this is only a problem so far as there is no fiscal backing, but fiscal backing should be understood in that sense, in the sense that positives must be offset by negatives, or negatives by positives. Let me skip my radical suggestion uh, in the interest of times. Um, yeah, yeah, so I should skip it. Uh, read it. I have a radical suggestion to sever that. Set of assets held by the central bank, what assets should be in that resource constraint? What should it be holding? What should be as part of the control variables? Financial crisis justifies holding other assets beyond simply short-run treasuries. It justifies it because there's a need, the transmission mechanism is broken, the central bank wants to affect the series of relative price in the economy beyond the short-term real interest rates. Because it gives it a means, in a financial crisis, markets are illiquid, so even the relatively small interventions that a central bank can make can be effective. And it gives it an ambition, in that in a financial crisis, we may think that relative prices are distorted relative financial prices, and therefore that maybe the central bank, by intervening, can do something. 
At the same time, there are some important objections. In the same way that illiquid markets make interventions effective, they also make it very hard to unwind and therefore likely that one will, will suffer losses. In the same way that correcting the sort of relative prices gives it an ambition, it also gives it a danger that one becomes overconfident about spotting distortions here and there. More, more, more to the point, I would say that when we see that there's a distortion in a market, our usual approach from, say, industrial organization, we think there's a problem with excess pollution or not, is not to go and buy and sell pollution for the most part, but rather to tax and subsidize pollution. And so there's an argument for why is it that when it comes to central banking, we're not talking more about regulation sense of certainly taxation or using taxes and subsidies instead of having the central bank holdings long-term assets. Either way, this, for, these objections are strong enough that there should certainly be some design limits are those in the unusual and exigent circumstance camp versus the treasurers only? I think they delimitate the, uh, the edges of what's possible, but more, there's quite a few reasonable in-betweens, such as not having ad hoc interventions or only buying when there's a liquid enough market price so that one does not get into some of the objections. Paying interest on reserves, because Paul Volcker is, has much greater stature than me in all meanings of the word, um, <laughs> and since he said quite clearly, that you should not pay interest on reserves, I felt like I had to use capital letters and say, yes, you should pay interest on reserves. Um, and you should pay interest on reserves partly for the reasons of the last session that we discussed. It is important that the central bank provides liquidity to markets, in particular in lender of last resort. The only way to separate the provision of liquidity from the inflation objective of the central bank is to have the separation of two instruments. One, the short-run interest rate, such as the federal funds rate to affect inflation, and two, the interest on reserves or the spread between the two in order to affect the size of the balance sheet and therefore the provision of liquidity into the market. And so paying interest on reserves is extremely important precisely for the reason in the last session. One could even go further, of course, and remind people of the Friedman rule, that even though it, that when it comes to reserves, the Friedman rule, which is, again, a very strong lesson from monetary economics, says that we should not just pay interest on reserves, but have that interest be equal to the federal funds rate at all times, making interest on reserves the main policy instrument, because that is the way to satiate the market, at least for reserves, that part of money, not currency, but at least the reserves are provided. And so there's a strong armor for doing the current state of the world where we flood the market with liquidity. Finally, equilibrium implementability constraints. Let me, there's an argument for having announcement and commitments as, as in order to affect the actions and responses of agents. One of which, the classical one, is to prevent mismanagement. But one that I think the economic literature has contributed in the last 30 years is the Kindle and Prescott point that even if the central bank wants to do whatever is best for society and therefore is not trying to mismanage, still in doing so, it may have ex post temptations or time inconsistencies that lead to inferior outcomes. One way to answer that has been just remove some of those temptations, for instance, by what sometimes is, I think, incorrectly called central bank independence, but I would say instead having being insulated from, say, the temptation to, in, to create booms before elections. But I think, but here I subscribe to people like Lars Svensson or Vishari or Pat Kehoe, when they say that in some ways, targeting rules, inflation reports, have been the way to instead achieve what has been the solution of the theoretical literature, that is to achieve the rules or the commitment equilibrium, whereby by being transparent, you make sure that private agents are able to punish you very quickly if you ever deviate from your commitment and try to be, behave in a timely, consistent way. Okay? Transparency, let me talk about that very briefly, just to say, I don't want to, Gary Gordon already mentioned a little bit of argument about transparency. Let me just mention a few other arguments on transparency, which is that there are some arguments, the literature has tried to make sense of when could it be to be less, when could it be good to be more, less transparent. And some of the arguments have to do with it, transparency leading to more confusion rather than better understanding. How could that be? Well, for instance, if the central bank is too noisy in communicating its things, so that it leads private agents to expend too many real resources figuring it out. It could be because if news are released uh, much too early before they are relevant, such that they are discounted. It could be if they're not on the relevant state variables, or if they lead to overreaction to public signals, and therefore private signals being understated. I would just note that in almost all of the models that I know, and I've, I'm part of this literature of showing papers where transparency is bad, and that's fun in a theoretical perspective, but it should be known that in all of those papers, the answer is actually re rarely to be less transparent, but rather to be better at being transparent. That is, that in the same way that we don't conclude that just because, that we didn't conclude 80 years ago that because some movements in interest rates, sometimes interest rates up may be bad for the economy, we didn't conclude that therefore interest rates should be fixed. We conclude that therefore we should study better how to set interest rates. And something I think, and almost, I think the same applies to communication transparency. Um, 
One last point on channel of communication. I think an important issue here is should you speak with many voices? Many have argued that it is, when you have many voices, it is hard to make model-based monetary policy. I would like to point to one point that is very dear to my heart um, and on which I think researchers have as much of a blame as, um, as uh, the public, which is a confused disagreement for uncertainty. These are conceptually very different points. We can all disagree here and yet disagree in a very predictable way that engages in no uncertainty whatsoever. In the sense, there's nothing wrong with disagreement insofar as there's a clear rule for how that is overcome and that the different views are explained carefully. However, many of my colleagues will go and measure uncertainty by looking at dispersion of forecasts and disagreement across people and use that as measures of uncertainty. And so we are self-economists look at disagreement as being synonymous with uncertainty when it is not. And so this is though a very difficult challenge because even economists will make this confusion. Accountability, let me stop and just simply conclude by saying that um, I frame this in the terms of, there's, been, there's a few topics that are pervasive across this discussion, one of which is central bank independence. And the reason why I want to mention that one and single that out is that in some ways by looking at these 12 separate questions, by looking at objective functions, resource constraints, equilibrium constraints, you do not get an answer that central banks should be independent. You get a much more mixed message that one should be independent when it comes to, for instance, not having to provide resources to treasury, but at the same time having fiscal backing or having some way of being supported. One gets, uh, one gets that while you want to be independent when it comes to pursuing short run, some short-run trade-offs, not in terms of defining that the long-run goal should be a stable nominal anchor. And my final sentence is that, more generally, that central bank design is certainly important, but also that we can move beyond just vague thoughts like thou shalt not monetize the debt, but make the scientific in terms of using the literature um, and framing it in more slightly more formal terms as I try to make a step towards doing here. Thank you.